Good afternoon and welcome to um, video number 7B, don't ask. Um, so um, what I'm going to do today, uh, and this is the, the, the video number 7B uh, on the uh, history of the BBC or exploring the history of the BBC in the 20th century. And in the last few chapters, I went through from a particular point of view uh, from different uh, uh, summits in one way. I did a series of videos on the director generals and what difference they made. Uh, and then I did a, a series of videos on the commissions of inquiry, which governments put forward, whether Labour or Conservative, and that did make a difference, uh, to reflect on what needed changing or what didn't need changing uh, in the uh, for the next 10 years of the BBC Charter. Uh, so today I'm going to do something that's slightly different. I'm going to go on to a chronological approach. Uh, beginning in the 1920s, today is the BBC in the 1920s, uh, but with a hope or with the intention that you will know how to uh, anchor these different significant events, uh, which are highly selected, of course, a hundred things happen every year, but you, that you will understand or, or think over how to attach these events to the great questions of the history of the BBC, the BBC and elitism, the BBC and women, the BBC and uh, government, the BBC and finance, the BBC and creative Activity, the BBC and etc. Um, so let's get so let's let's get started. We're going to get started in, indeed uh, quite quite a way before the BBC, uh, and we're going to start with the, this uh, uh, Marconi. So he, he, of course, that's not how you spell his name. He doesn't have a C at the end. Marconi, uh, and here's a picture of him in 1901. Tremendously important uh, gentleman and gentle. I use the word advisedly because Marconi was an it Italian aristocrat educated by private tutors, and he uh, we were lucky because he developed a creative approach to his scientific research which he carried out at home with the help of his butler and he he was the one who developed wireless transmission of morse code messages morse code you know burp, 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 burp. Uh, morse code messages then which were already extremely important in society uh, there had been a, a a cable across the atlantic uh, for at least uh, 30 40 or 40 years I'm fairly sure. Uh, and so uh, you could get uh, get information immediately to New York from London, uh, but uh, only if there was a wire. You could only get it to places where there was a wire. Uh, and so he developed wireless transmission of this. And in 1895, he transmitted over a distance of half a mile. And many scientists were very surprised because they had predicted that half a mile was the maximum distance that this might be done at. In any case, getting insufficient, insufficient support from the Italian government, Marconi moved to London in 1896 and managed to get uh, uh, people at the top of the British General Post Office interested. And in 1898, uh, they uh, produced wider distances again. Uh, indeed, in 1898, for the first time, wireless telegraphy, so Morse code messages by radio, was first used to summon help for a ship in distress. 1899, first radio message from England to France, again Morse code. 1901, the first message from Cornwall to Canada, uh, and you can imagine that people were extremely excited about this. This was also, this was Marconi uh, doing uh, all, all these things, and indeed in 1912, when the, uh, this, uh, Tremendously famous uh, ship, the Titanic, that is the real Titanic, really at the bottom of the ocean. Uh, it was because of Marconi's wireless telegraphy uh, that help could be summoned for those who had managed to get on uh, a, a lifeboat. And that's why that um, famous actress was able, it was able to survive and make a film about it. Uh, in other areas of his life, uh, sadly, uh, Marconi was less of a hero. He joined Mussolini's fascist party in 1923. Meanwhile, in Paris, uh, around the same time, um, uh, a Frenchman, a very well-known Frenchman, one of the most famous Frenchmen in the world, Gustave Eiffel, was rather worried uh, because he was worried they were going to take his tower down, which was the original plan. It was brought up for the ex it was put up for the exhibition, and they were going to take it down. And so he was looking for ways to make his tower more useful. Uh, and he, he himself paid for experiments to establish a wireless telegraphy station at the top of the towel, tower. And this is one of the elements which persuaded the authorities to decide not to have the tower dismantled. Uh, it's in 1919 that we have the first private broadcast in, uh, in, in, in Europe. Uh, that, that, that is to say a, a broadcast of, uh, of, of sound and not of Morse. <coughs> 
so there's, the, there's, there's your Eiffel Tower with the in, in 1901, uh, and there you have the uh, the advert for the uh, first private broadcast in Europe. This is to say that uh, this is a soirée musicale, uh, which was put out uh, in 1919 from the PGC, PCGG of the Netherlands radio industry uh, in The Hague. Uh, and they, they put out a musical evening. Now, uh, not many people could listen to this because very few people had radios and wirelesses, as they called them then, but it was, very, it was tremendously impressive, of course. And in 1921, Radio Radio Tuchefel uh, gave its first uh, uh, concert, uh, and which brings us to the beginnings of our story. Really, in 1922, the British Broadcasting Company is founded. I think you you know uh, this by now. Uh, it's a company, a commercial company at the beginning, and it's only in 1927 it will become a corporation. Now we obviously need, in order to understand what the uh, what uh, the BBC was doing, we have to have some sort of vision of what the 1920s was like. Uh, at the beginning of the 1920s, Britain was still suffering very much from the aftermath of the First World War, and the world wounded soldiers were find finding they were being less and less treated uh, like heroes. The trade unions, which had gained millions of members during the war, uh, had a stronger position for, than before, and this was also reflected in the rise of the Labour Party, which had been founded in 1900 and was replacing little by little the Liberal Party as the alternative to the Conservatives. Uh, this is mainly because uh, many working class people could vote after 1884 and all working class men could vote after 1918 and uh, uh, all women over 30. Uh, and so the very, uh, and indeed the very first Labour government, a minority government, was elected in 1924. It only lasted a few months and it was a minority government, so it couldn't make uh, uh, that much progress, although they did int introduce a very important reform in social housing. Uh, however, they only lasted a few months of the election campaign which defeated the Labour government in 1924 and which brought the Conservatives back to offer into office, sorry, was uh, characterized by a famous fraud, the Zinoviev letter. So here you have the Daily Mirror and all the other newspapers were saying, you know, this letter came from the, the revolutionary government in Moscow calling on Labour Party uh, people uh, to prepare for revolution. Uh, although, in fact, this letter had been written by uh, f forgers, by, for, for, by a right-wing political group uh, somewhere in Germany. So it's one of the most famous frauds of the, uh, 20, uh, the, 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 the 20th century. But it had some success and helped the Conservatives get back uh, into office. Uh, and uh, shortly afterwards, we will have the big general strike of 1926, which I'll, I will come back to because it's a very key uh, turning point in the history of the British Broadcasting Company. Uh, the 1920s of, is, is, is also the jazz age. Uh, Charlie Chaplin was on at the cinema. Uh, the dance halls were on the rise. And by the end of the decade, the arrival of the microphone on stage and the talky movie at the cinema transformed popular entertainment. We must re remember that we, we have the impression that today things change so fast. People have always had this impression, or at least always in the last few hundred years, uh, which is the, the uh, period that, uh, that I've been studying. In, 19, in the 1920s, you know, um, people were saying in 1930, the older people said, oh, films where you can hear them talking. Well, that's very modern. Uh, and of course, the radio, uh, was, uh, which will rise in the 1920s, was one of this tremendously uh, important changes uh, in uh, in. Uh, technology. Society was changing too. Families were already getting smaller. Three or four children was the most common. Diseases such as tuberculosis and polio remained common, uh, as was whooping cough, diphtheria and scarlet fever. And certainly some of the people who mistrust vaccines today uh, should take a little trip, tip in a, a little trip in a, a time capsule and go back to the 1920s. I, I think they might think again very, very quickly. So the 18th of October, the formation of the British Broadcasting Company. So a, a, a coalition, uh, an umbrella coalition of, of private companies who, who mostly sold radios. That's why they did, they sold radios. Uh, and when they sold the radio, there was a tax on it, which paid for the British Broadcasting Company, which made the programs. Of course, if you made programs, people would be more likely to buy radios. 
And this was a tremendous contrast. This British Broadcast Company already had some ideas really of public service, even though it was a private company made for, made for private profits. Um, and uh, they uh, in particular were pleased to uh, contrast to the entirely market-driven broadcasting uh, developing in the United States and in uh, Canada. And here's the, this is the, it's actually the transmitter, the London transmitter 2LO. Uh, remember that uh, uh, when the radio gets going in the 1920s, it will only be a few hours a day and only around the big towns. Huh? It's going to take a while. On the 14th of December, 1922, John Reith was hired to become the managing director of the company. So a couple of months after its founding. So strictly speaking, John Reith was not the founder of the British Broadcasting Company. Uh, he might be called the founder, founder of the British Broadcasting Corporation, perhaps. Um, this all, this all, this was very, all this was tremendously new, and as you can see by the, from this joke uh, in a uh, in a nineteen twenties uh, uh, magazine, where they discuss, where they're talking about this new idea of wavelength. What wavelength is this? Is the is the wireless station transmitting at? And so wavelength, what's that? It's a new idea. Uh, uh, at least it's new in the, in the popular um, discourse. And so here you can see, well, they catch the waves and they measure their length. That's the, what they do. It's just a, a joke, of course. On the 31st of December 1926, the company will be dissolved and uh, it will be transformed into the uh, British Broadcasting Corporation. But not yet. We're, we're still in 1923 for the time being and going through year by year. And here we have a tremendously important set of statistics. How many people, how many homes had a wireless? They had to pay the wireless license. How many were there? Well, in 1922, there were 35,000. And in 1923, 600,000. And in 1924, 1 1.2 million. Uh, so you can see we're talking about an explosive growth, uh, an extremely exciting exponential growth uh, in the number of wirelesses. And un unsurprisingly, at this time, the government is taking it more and more seriously, whereas the beginning, it might have seemed to be a small phenomenon. Uh, a, a, small, a small phenomenon. Uh, many people, of course, didn't know what it was. Um, and so they might, if they wanted to know what it was, they couldn't uh, check it out and see if there's a, a, a YouTube tuto on it because there wasn't. Uh, and so they might go to a meeting and here you have a meeting in the High Street Hall at Peckham, uh, which is a, a demonstration of broadcasting, a demonstration so you can go and see what a wireless looks like when it's receiving from a long way away music and speech. Uh, so something uh, something very exciting for people to go and see, yes, uh, uh, demonstrating, they will be demonstrating on actual broadcast signals, okay? Uh, and you also say, you see notice there, uh, let's, uh, would you like to hear about wireless from a woman's point of view? Okay, so there's an interesting uh, uh, idea there, um, so especially since the uh, uh, 1918 18 law, which gave after decades and decades of activism, which gave women over 30 uh, the right to vote, there was a tremendous interest in the 1920s about how women were going to become citizens uh, rather than just wives of citizens. Uh, and here is a, a receiver from 1922. That's and so you very often would have to listen with through the headphones. Yes, it wouldn't necessarily have immediately about loudspeaker. Let more and more of them were having loudspeakers uh, 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 involved. Uh, and as well as those people who were paying the license and buying a radio, well, there were quite a lot of people just making their own radio, uh, which is quite difficult to do. But um, no, a lot, a lot of people learn how to do it. In 1923, you have this uh, this uh, poster here of the uh, call for capital, and it's just a reminder for us, really, that it was just a company like any other. So you you uh, if you were rich or if you had a thousand pounds to spare, which was a lot of money at the time, then you might invest it in the British Broadcasting Company once you'd seen that it was a rising uh, interest, that it was, was going to make uh, money. Uh, and then you, you would hope to get a dividend every year, uh, interest on your uh, money. In any case, a number of other thing, important things happened in 1923. Uh, the British National Opera Company's production of the Magic Flute from Co Covent Garden was the occasion for the first ever outside broadcast. 
And in February, a station in Cardiff began broadcasting and in March, one in Glasgow. So we're getting this spread out uh, across the nation. And the very first sports report came from the famous uh, horse race, the Derby uh, in March. Uh, whereas in September, for the first time ever, they produced the, the BBC's official magazine, the Radio Times. Uh, and today in uh, 2020, this magazine is called the Radio Times. We like tradition, tra tradition uh, in, in Britain. And here, as you can see here, inside here, you can see all the programmes now at this time in 19, uh, 1923, uh, only a few hours a day. Uh, but um, interestingly enough, for a very long time, it only gave uh, the programmes for the BBC. Uh, and certainly in the in the 70s, when I was young, you had to buy two magazines, Radio Times to see what was on the BBC and TV Times to see what was on independent television, the commercial television. So there we go. Uh, this is also the moment when the Sykes report was published. Uh, another couple of events from 1923, when this brand new way of uh, uh, passing the evening uh, was being di di uh, di uh, discovered, uh, is that they established a series of talks for women. And again, this is linked with uh, what I was telling you about uh, women getting interested in what it meant to be a citizen and the very first talk in the series talks for women was done by princess alice uh who gave a talk on the adoption of children okay so the very first, the, 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 the very very first one these were tremendously ex exciting tremendously successful in 1923 they had 150,000 listeners in 1927 9 million listeners in 1939, 34 million listeners. This is something unheard of in centuries of communication history previously. Uh, interestingly enough, at the BBC, and let's talk about this more in, in a moment, uh, women managers were paid the same as men. Uh, and uh, John Reith uh, quite uh, uh, encouraged brilliant women to come in. And uh, it was him who went to recruit Hilda Matheson, who was head of talks. So what did these talks for women uh, talk about? Well, there were talks about electricity, talks about cooking, 12 talks every week. The speakers were not always paid. Uh, they were, it was sometimes expected to do it for the, for the glory uh, and uh, included uh, talks by fashion, uh, about fashion, poultry keeping, tennis, dancing and bridge. A former suffragist, suffragist Lady Emmett, spoke on how local government affects the home and a certain Miss Smee uh, talked about women and public health. So these early talks, as, uh, as uh, I'm quoting for somebody, but I don't know who, these early talks reflect an understanding of an audience who were interested in their appearance, had time for leisure, and were also grappling with the notion of citizenship. They also indicate a listenership that was patently viewed as middle class. Now, it is true that the wireless was quite expensive, so the audience probably was going to be middle class. Middle class. Now, uh, these uh, talks for women were a tremendous institution, which uh, introduced to the British public a whole series of people. For example, uh, this lady, Marion Cran. Now, Marion Cran would become the BBC's first ever celebrity gardener, and she gave her first gardening chat in August 1923. And there's a whole history to this because even today, Gardener's Question Time on BBC Radio 4 is, a, is an institution. Uh, people uh, ask questions about their gardens, the, the, the plants they're having problems with, and a panel of experts answers the questions every week. And it's been going on every week for um, the longest time. I mean, probably 50 years or so, but certainly, certainly decades and decades. Um, and so here it's interesting, yeah, especially because we we sometimes think because we're um, knowledgeable about the big changes for women in the 1960s, 1980s, uh, 2000s and so on. We often exaggerate uh, our image of uh, women from the 20s and imagine that they were all ju all just ho housewives at home. This was absolutely not the case. Uh, and uh, certainly among the elite, uh, one could become uh, quite uh, a celebrity. Uh, other talks in the talks for women were hints for holidays which was uh, about uh, where to go on holiday and uh, learn a little bit of French. And this, this then very clearly addressed at middle-class women. There were no working-class women going on holiday at Fra in France uh, in the 1920s. Also the new careers for girls talk, talked about being a museum curator, curator, a solicitor, a journalist. And these would only be uh, available to well-educated young women 
who had perhaps gone to university. Uh, so we were talking about a very small uh, section. Um, uh, uh, three women uh, members of parliament uh, 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 spoke on the, the, the talks and the, uh, the an analysis done of readers' letters, because people used to write, I mean, the BBC used to receive thousands of letters every day for decades and decades, you know, uh, it's, uh, uh, sometimes even more. Uh, and uh, the letters received by the Women's Talks Committee, the Women's Advisory Committee, uh, uh, came to uh, address the issue of whether talks for women should be more domestic about how to run the family in the home uh, or whether they should be more uh, showing horizons, horizons far outside the home. And the reader's letters certainly tended to say uh, less domesticity, please. Uh, in 1928, one of the first examples of listeners' contributions uh, was uh, made in the Talks for Women. Listeners' recipes and hints for cooking were read out. Uh, meanwhile, they had child health talks uh, uh, using doctors to talk to mothers. Uh, and they also had talks on, on difficult topics. Uh, for example, they did a talk on stammering. Yes, they're stammering of peach, speech impediments, uh, things which were far more common at the time. And even when I was young, stammering was um, far more common than today uh, because the whole um, structure of psychological treatments that uh, we have today didn't, didn't, uh, didn't, didn't exist. So let's move on to 1924. And in 1924, relay stations were slowly opening. So town after town, the smaller towns were beginning to also uh, get uh, their relay stations. So you, it was worth buying a radio, uh, even if you lived in a smaller town, although even though they were, they were quite, uh, quite expensive, of course. Uh, interestingly enough, at the time, the local radio stations in, in Liverpool or Leeds or Hull or Newcastle, uh, each town had a completely different approach, uh, so they didn't, they didn't, it wasn't at all a, uh, a national approach. Yeah, there would be, so in the Radio Times you had you know, the London programme and the Manchester programme, uh, and you might occasionally ha have them exchanging uh, pro programmes, but in general it was very different uh, in each time. It was a very exciting time, the very first children's programmes, the invention of current affairs programmes, um, the broadcasting of the time signal direct from Paris. <coughs> Why not? And the very first theatre companies set up especially for radio. Now, they, they, they used to hire, they, they decided to hire writers to write the first radio plays because they received uh, scripts from writers, playwrights, uh, for radio plays, and they often found that they were no good at all because they were written for the stage. And if you couldn't see people, they just didn't work. Um, although some of the writers were very creative, one writer decided to write plays which actually took place in the dark. For example, one of his plays was about people being lost down a coal mine and all the lights went out, all the electricity and, and, the, and the gas uh, or whatever, and probably electricity by then, yes. Um, uh, all, all, that went, all that went away. Uh, and so everything, the actual, all the action of the play happened in the dark. Yes, yeah, so that's uh, uh, quite creative. And, uh, and they also invented uh, sound effects because uh, today, of course, if you work for the BBC, you have you know two million sound effects and you just check them out. Uh, but that wasn't the case uh, in, in, uh, in in the time. Uh, in 1924, then the uh, King George V made his first ever broadcast when he opened the British Empire exhibition at Wembley Stadium. And uh, broadcasting in 1924 started up in Edinburgh, Leeds and Liverpool. So they had had to wait a, a couple of years. Uh, and uh, the gentleman who edited the listener for, uh, oh, from 1929 to 1939, uh, gave his opinion on what the atmosphere was in the early days of radio. This is what he said, all kinds of petty discomforts Overcrowded rooms, long hours, arbitrary or tactless treatment were overlooked in the general sense of adventure, progress and public service. You felt it a privilege to be in at the birth of such a mighty experiment. An experiment not merely in the use of a new invention, broadcasting, but in its use for communal ends rather than for uh, private profit. That's a, uh, a quotation from the book by uh, Charlotte Higgins, but it's actually a quotation from what Richard Lambert said, who edited The Listener. We'll be talking about The Listener in a moment. The Radio Times was uh, the magazine that you bought uh, if you wanted to uh, know what was on the radio and a few short articles uh, uh, about uh, about radio or sometimes about the stars on the radio uh, the listener however was uh, the magazine you bought if you wanted long articles long rather intellectual articles 
about broadcasting or about the big questions that have been discussed on the radio um, this week. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's a weekly, uh, it might be every two weeks, I'm not quite sure. They had a some difficulty with the uh, news because news bulletins have always been uh, 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 something that people uh, imagined wanting from uh, radio. But in fact, they immediately ran into problems because the the great daily newspapers, who were very powerful and very profitable companies, were worried to see the radio come along and reduce. They thought uh, the number of, of papers that the newspapers that they were going to s sell, uh, and certainly they thought, well. If the radio is going to give every two hours a news bulletin, nobody will buy any newspapers. Um, they, were, they, they, they were also influential in another way. One of the reasons, there were many reasons, but one of the reasons the BBC decided no advertising was so as to not, not to compete with the, uh, the newspapers who, who would, have been, would have been very unhappy about that. Uh, in any case, the pressure of the great uh, uh, press, uh, newspaper, the great newspaper barons, uh, uh, led to a compromise where the postmaster general, the minister, um, even though parts of the BBC, uh, the British Broadcasting Company, complained, uh, decided to impose a ban on presenting news uh, uh, in, 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 in two different ways, which I'll mention in a moment. I just need to let the cat out. It's all live, this. Uh, so what they said is, first of all, the BBC was not allowed to have any news bulletins during the day. They could only have news bulletins in the evening after the last edition of the newspapers had been sold. And secondly, the BBC was not allowed to, uh, to hire journalists to, to create news. They could simply summarize the content of the newspapers. Initially, this agreement was signed only for a period of six months, uh, but it lasted for a long time. Only in 1935 did the BBC create a specific news department. And when it opened up in 1935, it had five journalists. Only the, the, the arrival of the Second World War, uh, when regu regular news bulletins appeared to be uh, indispen uh, uh, indispensable, uh, put an end to these restrictions. And by 1940, the BBC is presenting 10 news bulletins every day. Uh, so this is an, a, an initial example of how competition um, uh, affected the, uh, the BBC. If we move through to 1925, I have an example here of a wireless from 1925. You can see cabinet work in any period. So that's interesting. So you can actually order one. So I would like it in the Queen Anne style. I would like it in the Victorian style. I would like it in Regency style. Uh, so here you can see that because the red wi wirelesses are, are expensive, uh, they want to uh, seduce the bourgeoisie to, to buy them. And one of the ways they do this is by making them also beautiful pieces piece of furniture, uh, because there was always a risk that the, the newfangled wireless be seen as vulgar uh, by the bourgeois. And so here you can see the battery is all enclosed. All British and most continental stations on headphones and most on the cunningly incorporated loudspeaker. Yeah, this is a 1925 one. Very, very uh, exciting. Um, now, in 1925, also, the long wave station called 5XX becomes the first British station, radio station to achieve near national cover, uh, coverage. And this is also the year when the Crawford Committee uh, reports recommending that uh, radio should be run by a corporate co corporation, sorry, a public corporation, uh, and I quote, acting as trustee for the national interest. There's another, another 1925 uh, model there, a four valve cabinet receiver. Uh, and as you can see, that one costs 49 pounds. And I've forgotten my calculation about how much it, how much it costs. It's a, it's a huge amount of money. Uh, it's... I think it's about a year's a year a year of the average wage that one. Of course, there were cheaper ones, but it's really pretty uh, expensive. Now, 1926 was marked by the general strike. Uh, uh, there had been a general strike before in the 1840s, but the 1926 general strike was the only general strike of the um, 20th century uh, in, uh, in in Britain. Millions of workers went on strike in support of the miners who were threatened with a wage cut and a lengthening of the working day. Thousands of strikers and their supporters fought against police who were trying to get the trams working. 
many volunteers from social elites like Oxford University students tried to replace workers in power stations and on trains to keep everything running. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, the father of one of my friends, uh, uh, who's unfortunately de uh, deceased now, uh, he told me how he, re he remembered in 1926, I think he was uh, 15 or something, uh, uh, he remembered throwing coal at the students who were trying to run the trains. Uh, so he was sort of throwing coal in Wales in support of the strike. Uh, the strike lasted for nine days and then the Trade Union Congress called off the strike. There were almost no newspapers during the strike. There were actually two newspapers, the government uh, newspaper, which I'm pretty sure was run by Winston Churchill, um, and the trade union newspaper. And in the absence of the other newspapers, the BBC produced five news bulletins every, uh, every, uh, every day. And here you can see uh, a picture of miners and railway men uh, waiting to hear a news bulletin. Uh, now, I've already put on the, on the blog a... a uh, uh, vid uh, a video from Al Jazeera which talks about um, moments when there'd been tension between the BBC and the government and, and it gives this example 1926. The crisis uh, of the general strike put the BBC in a delicate position. On the one half, on the one hand, uh, John Reith was acutely aware that at any time the government might just take over the BBC. So it's, a, it's a national emergency, get rid of the management, we're running it. But on the other hand, uh, he uh, so so he was he was worried about that. On the other hand, he didn't want to simply repeat government propaganda because he said people will not believe us anymore if we're just uh, uh, you know here is the minister speaking. Um, the government was divided divided on the question. Some of them wanted to take over the BBC. Some of them didn't. Uh, and eventually, a compromise was found in which the BBC did present some views from strikers or from people who supported the strike. Uh, however, uh, they were, the BBC management were very much against the strike and indeed they did use censorship. They banned some broadcasts from the Labour Party and they delayed a peace appeal by the Archbishop of Canterbury. Indeed, uh, uh, not everybody's happy because supporters of the strike nick nicknamed the BBC the BFC, the British Falsehood Company. Uh, right, Re John Reith personally announced the end of the strike on the radio, uh, uh, reciting from Blake's, Blake's poem, Jerusalem, signifying that England had been saved. Uh, now, of course, the, when in the when in many BBC, many histories of the BBC, uh, emphasis is put on the on the fact that they were not uh, completely subservient to government. Uh, nevertheless, Jean Seaton, who, who wrote, wrote a, a, an authorised history of the BBC, characterised the episode, episode as, and I quote, the invention of modern propaganda in its British form, because John Reith had argued that the trust gained by authentic impartial news could then be used. Impartial news then was not necessarily an end in itself, but about uh, building public trust uh, in order to uh, support the government in a more indirect ma uh, manner. Uh, in any case, the government was very happy with the BBC uh, and this uh, led uh, uh, to the acceptance of the uh, establishment of the British Broadcasting Corporation very easily. One more there. Oh, no, that's, a, that's, a 19, that's a 1926 uh, uh, example uh, of, a, of a wireless then. So in 1927, 1st of, 1st of January, a Royal Charter comes into effect transforming the British Broadcasting Company into the British Broadcasting Com Corporation. And Sir John Reith, who had already been the key leader of the company, becomes the first Director General. Uh, and this is all, also the time, the first uh, live sports broadcast, the first sports broadcast had not been live, uh, a rugby match between England and Wales. Uh, in March uh, 1927, the BBC was provided with a coat of arms, which has changed little since. Now, coats of arms traditionally belonged to aristocratic families, although elite schools and army regiments would also have them. So what should we think of this decision to use a coat of arms in an, uh, a domain so resolutely modern as radio broadcasting? It might show the positive image of private schools and noble families among the elite which controlled the corporation. And it could be a sign that people saw the BBC, the work of the BBC as a kind of crusade. And indeed the motto there, nation shall speak peace unto, unto nation, a motto which was changed in uh, 19, uh, 1934, uh, shows the crusading side, uh, uh, the crusading side of this. 
1927 is also the moment when Hilda Matheson becomes the first director of talks. So some of the, uh, the talks for women I, I, I mentioned to you earlier in this video were before Hilda Matheson was, uh, was, the, was, the, was the boss there. But uh, uh, John Reith brought uh, uh, Hilda Matheson in uh, and uh, she arranged the first ever live debate on radio by representatives from the three political parties of the time. Uh, she had been working as a private secretary to one of the very few uh, women members of parliament uh, and she had a lot of friends among the Bloomsbury group, uh, group of artists, critics, critics and writers and indeed her partner uh, Vita Sackville-West uh, was, was one of them. Um, Matheson was able to get in very prestigious people. H.G. Wells uh, came in to broadcast his views on world peace uh, and and so on, so on and so uh, uh, and so forth. So she got a lot of prestigious people, and this was a, a gold, the golden age of wireless. Uh, and indeed, uh, the golden age of wireless is, I think, the, the name of volume two. I'm pretty sure it's volume two uh, of Asa Briggs' great uh, history. Uh, the BBC also decided to take over the organisation of the proms. This is that is the series of the promenade con uh, concerts. These had existed for some time as the Henry Wood pro uh, promenade concerts, and now they became the BBC proms. Um, and uh, it's a series of classical music concerts. Uh, Mondays were Wagner, Fridays were Beethoven, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, and later on, uh, the proms would become a national institution rather contradictory, very often seen as a nationalist uh, conservative celebration because uh, famously at the last night of the proms, the audience, unlike usually in classic con classical concerts, makes a lot of noise and sings imperialist songs. Uh, rule Britannia, Britannia rule the waves, um, and uh, things like that. And, uh, and God save the Queen would be, you know, what the other words to the God save, yeah, wider still and wider, may thy, may thy bounds be set. God who made this country mighty, make her mightier yet. And it's from God save, God save the Queen. Uh, and so that well, the BBC will be the centre of this quite important and contradictory uh, institution. Also, 1927, Christopher Stone presents a record programme, a gramophone recital, he calls it, and he becomes then the first ever British disc jockey. Finally, then we get on to 1928, and the most important thing about 1928 is all women will get the vote, or all women over 21, that is to say, women will get the vote at elections on the same basis as men. Uh, and there is a lot to say about the about women in the BBC. Uh, and one of the things I'd like to say about women in the BBC is that uh, John Reith was unusually enthusiastic about uh, elite women uh, uh, becoming uh, managers in, in, in the BBC. Uh, and he said in so in so many words, he said, there is no reason a woman should not be a station director. Uh, and uh, men and women should get equal pay. So the BBC in the 1920s was relatively progressive, at least for, the, for the, those women who were uh, at the top of the scale. Uh, there were, and there also, there was no marriage bar in the BBC in the 1920s. What's a marriage bar? A very simple idea. Existed since before the First World War in banking, in insurance, in the civil service, uh, in schools often. And this is very simple, and that is that uh, women began to work, say at 13 or 14, uh, when they were single, and when they got married, say at 26 or 27, uh, they stopped working, they resigned their job, and they concentrated on uh, 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 working at home with housework. Now, you must remember that housework was 10 times harder than it is today. Uh, so it was, uh, it, was, uh, it was not just... Uh, 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 the, the, this this factor uh, encouraged uh, women to accept uh, the, the, this this position. Uh, uh, let's say, uh, and so the BBC, interestingly enough, didn't have a marriage bar. There was no need for you to resign, although there was a tradition of women resigning when they get married. It was uh, looked down a little bit not to resign. Uh, however, in 1932, and I'll get to that uh, in the next video, the BBC does impose a marriage bar, and this imposition is partly because the BBC is becoming more and more part of the establishment <coughs> and uh, 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 freezing the position in women, uh, uh, the position of women in the same way that uh, the civil service and the banking and insurance uh, industries had done uh, was part of that. But that's all we have for time for today. Uh, and so th this was uh, video number 70, uh, 7B, uh, the BBC in the 1920s. So they just click on this button, it will all be over while the show.